Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Path to DevOps series. Today, on our list of tasks, we have just one, the Create Infrastructure one, which is basically where we will create an Azure Kubernetes Services cluster. Okay, so let's move this one inactive and let's start working. Before we start actually creating the Kubernetes cluster, let me share a secret with you. We're trying to deploy a resource to the cloud, right? Well, there are multiple ways we can achieve this. There's PowerShell, there's Azure CLI, there's infrastructure as code solutions, such as Terraform. We can use ARM templates. We can even use the Azure portal. Yeah, so there's a lot of solutions we can go to. But in reality, everything is actually going through a REST API, which sits in front of the Azure resource provider you're trying to deploy, yeah, of the resource you're trying to deploy. So each resource will have a resource provider, okay? And that resource provider implements a RESTful API. So every one of these five solutions, and even more, if there are, because obviously there are, uh, they all talk to the REST API and the REST API actually creates the resource in the resource manager, okay? So it's pretty much the same thing. It's a REST API, but you interact with it in different ways, okay? And each way has its own particularities. But today we're going to resort to the Azure portal. And the reason why we're creating an AKS cluster manually, even though this is called Path to DevOps, is because you can't be a DevOps, you can't automate something, and obviously that's my opinion, maybe others will contradict me, but you can't automate something you haven't done manually before. How can you know how to automate a process if you haven't done the process manually before, okay? So I would say, I would argue that you need, especially as a beginner, to create your own AKS cluster or your own any type of resource and any type of cloud provider just so you know how the interface looks and how it all feels, okay? So today we're doing just that. We're jumping into resource creation via the Azure portal. And here we are in the Azure portal. So the first thing we need to do is actually uh, select the Kubernetes services icon here. Or if you don't have it, just search for AKS and you will find this um, purple group of hexagons, I guess. And you just click on it and create create a Kubernetes cluster. This is the first step, okay? Now, again, I, I understand that some of you might not have an Azure subscription and that's perfectly fine. You can search on the internet and you can open a trial version which will give you 30 days of free access. So if you want to follow along to this path to DevOps journey, Consider doing that. It will help you understand better how these resources actually uh, look like and getting hands-on experience is invaluable. Okay, that's my train of thought. So we're trying to create a Kubernetes cluster. And as you can see here, we have a lot of menus and I'll try to break them down one by one and explain what each of them means and what they want from you, all right? So the first thing is you're selecting information where you want to create this cluster. So uh, I will choose the appropriate subscription and by appropriate subscription, I'm trying to say uh, the subscription that my Azure DevOps organization or project knows about, okay? Uh, in the previous episode, we've created something called a service connection in Azure DevOps, and uh, in that service connection, we've pointed to a subscription. So make sure that the subscription in here is the same one in your service connection, okay? Uh, then we will need a resource group, and I will create a new one. Uh, and I'll call it Shiki minus RG. And this is it. Now for cluster preset configuration, I'm a cheap person. So uh, I'm going to go with dev slash test, which has only $1 sign. So this is pretty cheap. Um, my cluster name will be Shiki minus AKS. And it's validating and saying that everything is fine here. I will choose a region closer to myself and I'm uh, in Europe. So I'll choose North Europe, for example. Uh, now, availability zones uh, is basically asking you in how many data centers from the same region you want your uh, cluster replicated. And uh, if I wanted high availability uh, or higher availability, I would choose maybe multiple of these, but I don't care. It's just a dev or it's just an example cluster that we're using to deploy to. Uh, obviously, when you're working on a project for business requirement, you will have to take this into consideration, but I don't want to go 
that in depth right now okay so just keep in mind that's what availability zones means uh data centers in the same geographic region but that are separated by a certain distance yeah so uh some sort of uh 100 kilometers away from one another so if a natural disaster happens something like uh, an earthquake a tsunami power outage then if one fails the others will still be up there and resilient okay and your workload wouldn't be compromised now, in terms of Kubernetes version, whatever it suggests, I'm fine with it. Uh, I don't want to have more availability. So again, these are called SLAs, uh, service level agreements, and it's basically guaranteeing you that you will have this level of service. So 99.9%, .9%, uh, I think it means something like a few hours every year of downtime. 99.5 is even more than that, almost up to a day. I'm not sure exactly, I don't want to calculate this, but obviously, uh, you could optimize for the better one. I don't want to. Again, as I said, this is a demo sort of thing. So keeping it cheap, okay? Uh, then we reach the node size. So as we said, um, Kubernetes, and if you don't know this, just follow my series on Kubernetes first. But Kubernetes uh, as a cluster has two uh, major structures. Uh, it's the API server, like uh, we're choosing availability here for the API server. And because it's a managed Kubernetes cluster, so Azure provides it, we don't really have access here. So we just set the SLA and that's it. We don't care about it. But we have the node pools, which will basically be virtual machines or uh, virtual machine scale sets. And we do have access there and that's where our workload will be hosted. So it asks us to choose a size. And in my case, uh, standard uh, B4 MS is more than fine for what I'm trying to do here. Then it asks you to choose a scaling method. Uh, manual means that you need to input how many nodes you want. And if you need to increase the number of nodes, then uh, you must do that on your own, so manually. Auto scale means you set up some rules, uh, maybe CPU threshold, memory threshold, and based on those rules, uh, the scaling is done for you. Yeah. So if load surges, let's say, uh, it will add nodes for you. If loads decreasing, then it might remove uh, nodes from your uh, scale set, D depending on you, yeah, you choose this. So I don't really care about it. I'm just going to leave the defaults uh, as they are uh, moving on to node pools. As I said, um, the node pools are where your workload will be hosted, but you can also have multiple node pools, okay? So by default, it comes with one node pool. You can add others if you want to have different uh, node sizes. Maybe you want your Kubernetes cluster to store multiple applications and some of them are CPU intensive, other are memory intensive. So you would have multiple node pools uh, aligning to those necessities and then you would deploy your workload uh, in the node pools using something called um, Affinity. Yeah, so we're not talking about this right now, but keep that in mind, it's possible. I will leave this as is. We don't want virtual nodes, cool feature, but we're not interested at the moment. And this encryption default is more than fine. We don't want to have our own managed keys uh, in the mix and encrypt our disks with our own customer provided keys. Okay, so moving on to access. Uh, system assigned managed identity is perfect. We don't want to change anything here. And then uh, it's asking us about RBAC. RBAC stands for role-based access control. It's basically how do we want people to access our resources inside of Kubernetes? Yeah, we want anyone to be able to do anything, to delete pods, uh, deployments, stuff like that. And you have several options here. Um, usually I would choose this one, the middle one. It's basically an integration between Azure Active Directory and the Kubernetes native RBAC capability. So based on your user in uh, your tenant, uh, and you can't see it because I'm, I'll move myself. Yeah, so based on your user, you will be able to apply to groups of users or to certain users permissions in Kubernetes based on YAML manifests, okay? At the moment, we don't really care about this that much. So my plan is to use local accounts. This is the easiest way out. I'm just letting it as default and move on to networking. So in terms of network configuration, you have uh, two plugins here. Um, KubeNet is the more dev testy one. Azure CNI is the more complex one. Um, basically what it means, KubeNet, it's creating a virtual space inside of your nodes and your 
containers will run inside that virtual space. Uh, Azure CNI means uh, your containers will run in the same address space of your virtual network or subnet. This is quite advanced, so I don't want to go in very into detail, but this is the network plugin you want to apply, okay? Now, uh, DNS uh, domain name services, load balancer standard, it's fine. You don't want to enable private cluster means that you will actually have your API server inside of your VNet. This is pretty cool for security reasons, but right now, again, dev testing, we don't really care about all that. Um, set authorized IP ranges. This is very useful in terms of protection. When you're talking to the API server, you want to make sure that only you or your home office or your um, work office is able to access that API server and not any hacker from anywhere in the world, okay? So security, this is fine, but I don't want to do it right now. And network policy at the moment, none. Uh, it's cool feature inside of Kubernetes. Maybe we will talk about it in a future video. Then you have integrations and AKS because it's native Azure solution allows you to integrate with other stuff like for example, Azure Container Registry. But for this demo, we're going to use uh, our Docker Hub account. So I don't think you have an integration with that. So we leave it as none. We don't want to monitor with Azure Monitor. We don't want to have Azure policies at the cluster level. So everything is disabled. Uh, then infrastructure resource group, uh, AKS does this very interesting thing where it creates all of the resources it needs like load balancer, IP address, um, the virtual machine scale set, it needs a resource group to put all of that in. So you can actually modify the name. I won't. This is the default. So it starts with MC for managed cluster. And then there's the name of the resource group. And then there's the name of the cluster. And then there's the name of the region. Uh, this is their naming convention. And basically, when you hit create, uh, it will create this resource group automatically for you. And it will put all of the networking resources and your virtual machine scale sets, your basically your node pools inside of this resource group. Okay. And then a uh, secret store CSI driver. This is integration between Kubernetes secrets and Azure Key Vault. A very cool feature. Not going to use it now. Tags. As for any Azure resource, you can add tags. So I'm going to add myself as an owner. Not necessary, but it's pretty cool to look on a resource and see who owns it, right? And then we go to the review and create page. And we should be able to get the green check mark, which tells us that everything is fine and we can go on and create this Kubernetes cluster. So a few moments here. Let's see the validation passing. And again, as I said, validation passed. So everything is fine. I'm going to hit create and I'll see you guys in a few moments when everything is done a few moments later. All right, so the deployment of the AKS cluster is now complete. And if we hit the bell icon, you can see here deployment succeeded, go to resource. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So the AKS cluster, this purple hexagonal thing. Yeah. And you can see this is basically the interface to the control plane. You have the API server address and a lot of management information about the cluster. Uh, but if you want to see the nodes, uh, you have to search for MC underscore and find the resource group. So you can see here we have the um, IP address, the agent pool, network security group, routing table, uh, virtual network, the load balancer. The, the managed identity. So all the resources that the AKS cluster needs in order to function, it throws inside of this resource group. While the purple icon where we actually created the cluster, that's more of a management resource yeah, for the whole, uh, the cluster as a whole. Yeah. So this is how it looks. Now, let's set, let's test it out. So um, I'm going to get the credentials for this cluster. I have the command prepared here. There we go. And if we do kubectl get nodes, and you'll see that this got created a few minutes ago, okay, and it reached ready state. So this is quite the young cluster. Now that we have created our cluster, let's do the logical thing. And that is move our create infrastructure ticket into the resolved state. Okay, so this is pretty much it for today, guys. In the following episode, we will put everything together, uh, the pipeline, the manifest, the Kubernetes cluster, and we will deploy the applications to it, testing and seeing how everything works finally. Okay, so 
Thanks a lot for giving me your time today. If you appreciate this type of content, please leave me a comment down below, like and subscribe. It takes a great amount of effort to create these videos for you guys. So let me know if you appreciate it. Uh, once again, thanks a lot for giving me your time of the day and I wish you a great one. Goodbye.